civilization we're so busy slaughtering one another hating one another filled with fear and hatred and suspicion when in fact we're all one we're all brothers and sisters there's no difference between a, a, a human being from America and a human being from Turkey and a human being from the Amazon we're all human beings and we need to cultivate that spirit of love Never mind asteroids and comets. We're going to destroy ourselves unless, unless we actually show love. But we are the first civilization that could avert a cosmic disaster if we choose to do so. All it would take is the will and the love. Good afternoon, everyone. So if you will give us your attention... Please take a moment to ensure that your cell phones are turned off and prepare yourselves for one of the most brilliant speakers, I believe, on the planet today. Graham Hancock is an absolutely amazing researcher, author, and a wonderful person. And he is providing incredible information that is important to humanity. It is important for us to understand our true history. It is people like Graham, people like Dr. Robert Schock, like David Hatcher Childress, that are carrying that leading edge and providing that information that's light into the shadows. Graham has used the phrase that I think is absolutely brilliant that I've borrowed a few times. We are a species with amnesia. How well said, how beautifully stated. And so he is doing work that is so important. And he is one of the few people that has the strength and the articulate ability to defend positions against great odds. And that's what makes him one of the bright lights that can absolutely have the strength to push through the old thick energy of of the past, of the academia, of those that do not want to know the truth. And so an Earth Keeper standing round of applause for the amazing Graham Hancock, please.
thank you for, for the greeting. And uh, actually, I, I borrow some of James's phrases as well, <laughs> particularly, particularly the University of Duality. Well, I'm honored. It's <laughs> an, excellent, an excellent one. Um, I want to start by thanking James and Anne and all the team here for putting on this amazing event. <laughs> Really, I mean, you've, you've crea created a global family of open-minded people, and it's always a joy to, to come back and, and feel myself part of this family again. You are part of the family. You Thank, are you. Of the family. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to pay tribute to my colleagues, uh, Robert Schock, John Anthony West, Robert Boval, and many others uh, with whom I've been in the front lines with for, for many years, uh, trying to... Uh, get a change of paradigm of uh, ancient history. And I particularly want to thank my wife, Santa, who is sitting over there, <laughs> without whom I would long ago have lost my way. It is Mercury retrograde at the moment. <laughs> um, I believe in all of that. I have just the most unbelievable communication problems during Mercury retrograde, and uh, just an hour and a half ago, as I was doing a last run through my talk, my computer informed me that it didn't have sufficient memory to show lots of slides, <laughs> which really freaked me out. But I removed one or two, and it seems to have recovered its, uh, its memory again. Anyway, I, I, I was thanking my wife, Santa. Uh, she's been with me at the top of the Great Pyramid at the bottom of the ocean the last 22, 23 years. And uh, Santa has taken almost all the photographs that I'll be, I'll be showing today. Uh, so thank you, Santa, for keeping me on the straight and narrow. Um, I'm going to start, some of you will have seen these, I'm going to start showing two short videos. One of them lasts for two minutes, and the other one lasts for six minutes. The, they relate to the debate that I was supposed to have with Dr. Zahi Hawass <laughs> in Giza, in front of an audience of 80 people. Zahi Hawass had promised and had committed to that debate for more than a year, and those 80 people came along to hear that debate. I was there to represent the point of view of alternative history, which means that I needed to cover not only my own theories, but also the theories of others working in this field who are doing incredibly important work, like Robert Boval. It turns out that Dr. Zahi Hawass doesn't like Robert Boval. I suspect they may have had past life connections because, because the feeling is mutual and they both make each other very angry. But, but uh, Dr. Hawass used the fact that I was going to speak about Robert Boval to storm out of the debate. Now, he discovered I was going to speak about Zahi Hawass because he came into the debate when I was setting up my slides 20 minutes early. I was focusing the slides. I wasn't even expecting him to turn up at that point. And he came in and he saw a picture of Robert Boval on the screen and immediately went ballistic. There was one member of the audience who'd come early who had a cell phone with him. And he filmed what happened, not the first two or three minutes, where some of the most colorful language that I've ever heard in a long life was uh, projected in my direction. But the two or three minutes that followed that, so I'll start by playing this. And I don't want this to be much in academics. There is a very academic argument. In academic world, we do, well, we do not do ad hominem arguments. We do not debate the matter. Listen, we debate listen, the matter. This, the matter is debated really and it's closed. No, it's not. It is debated no. closed. It's closed in Chicago by all the three by everyone. Then I don't want to hear anything. Exactly. I don't want to hear anything. No, please, don't say this to me. Don't say this word to me. It's a shame on you, not on me. Don't talk to me. Please, go away from me. Shame on you. Why do you say shame on me? Watch. I don't want to talk to This man did bad things. I don't want to be his dead. This man. And I am going to be called. I am going to read this man not to print a discriminatory handbook. Because he's a cop. It's not my own business. Please, I don't want to talk to you. Please. Let me ask you.
Do I have someone talk about a kid or someone else? Why? Do I have talking about a kid that has closed? Do I have to open the video again? The theory is not closed. It is closed. No, it's not. Everywhere. And I don't know why you talk about it. It's not, it's his fucking game. Why do you talk about it? It's you not. have to present your own here. Not to present the game. It is not closed, sir. Okay, I closed it. And I am all that head before you closed it. I am presenting my own Okay, I'm not going to attend this, I have written to my school, Mr. Bob. I'm not going to attend this. Even before a word is exchanged, one image, and Mr. Hobbas leaves the room. Shame. I'm here. I'm willing to debate. I, I do believe this is a great shame for Egyptology. Well, I'm sorry, Bobal is central to the alternative army. Yeah. We cannot have a discussion without Bobal. So, so that was the the first bit. So Zahi sat outside for an hour and a half, sulking like a petulant child, while I gave my presentation, which he refused to listen to. Then uh, he came back in and gave his presentation. And at the end of his presentation, a member of the audience asked him a question about Gobekli Tepe. You see, the thing is that, as, as Robert Schock pointed out this morning, the argument has been that the Sphinx couldn't possibly be older because there was no other site in the world was that old. And the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, which is 12,000 years old, really does require us to reconsider all the arguments about the Sphinx. So let me show you that little bit as well, because that's the only time that I got the opportunity to stand up and actually debate Zahi a little bit. And that was six minutes. By the way, the moderator, who was the head of the Czech Archaeological Institute in Cairo, was specifically not supposed to intervene in the debate. But as you'll see, he did intervene in the debate. If we could have those lights off up, uh, up above, it would just massively increase my comfort level and allow the audience to actually see what's on the screen. OK, here we go. Thank you for your presentation. Um, as uh, one of the world's leading experts on um, Egypt, um, do you have um, a position, or are you going to um, present a position on um, what impact, if any, the um, excavations that Gobekli Tepe has had on your understanding of um, Gobekli Tepe? Um, what um, impact those excavations have on your understanding of Egypt's history? Who did the excavation again? Gobekli Tepe? The impact of the excavations that are going on in Turkey um, vis a vis um, Egypt's um, history. In Do I have to found in Turkey? Oh, no. Just as a leading expert on what Egypt's history is, um, what is the impact of these incredible excavations in Turkey? I don't know. Actually, I don't know. Well, maybe um, Graham could explain a bit and, and then you could comment. Is that possible? Sure. Yeah, if, if Dr. Hawass has read my talk, he would have seen the images and read the presentation. But go back to Tepe has been excavated by the German Archaeological Institute uh, by Klaus Schmidt. Uh, go back to Tepe is firmly dated to 9600 BC. Uh, it consists of a vast series of gigantic megalithic pillars, uh, more than 70% of which are still underground, but were built by Ram Petra and Rayo. Uh, and um, it uh, raises questions over the origin of civilization, since we have not anywhere in the world before found a gigantic megalithic construction dated to 11,600 years ago. Uh, and since Turkey is not very far away from here, as 
since either of these two of them are first of all very distinct, uh, I think it's relevant to consider the uh, recent discovery of a gigantic megalithic site in Turkey dated to 11,600 years ago. I wonder whether we should raise questions about the Sphinx again. I do think that what has been said is right. It has nothing to do with anything. In my opinion, we know the nature of the Sphinx. What has been found in Turkey, I don't think, and I don't know if this is true or not. I have, did you ever hear about it? Make a copy sure. Um, the Turkey, yeah. the Eastern Turkey, actually. Um, if you look at the um, project mosaic for ancient Egypt and compare the Quebec to Turkey, which dates actually from the late 11th millennium BC to the 10th millennium BC, uh, these are two civilizations walking apart. And I wouldn't call it a civilization in the case of Quebec to Tepe, because civilization is characterized by several um, features like high culture, religion, etc. So we know about Quebec to Tepe is that those people living 7,000 years before ancient Egyptian civilization came into being created these circular, say, temples or sacred places that the monoliths are three to four meters high. So no, Reda showed anything? Because I don't believe in Reda. I have been using Reda all oh my life. It's never made it in the sky. No, well, I'm afraid the radar does show, and you're discrediting the German Archaeological Institute. And Professor Klaus Schmidt, who sadly passed away a few months ago, a very sincere and decent, hardworking man, uh, who has published his findings on which are not in dispute. The Bank is 11,600 years old. It is a giant megalithic site. It isn't very far from Egypt. It is a relevant context, in my view. At least it should cause us to have some curiosity about some of the sites in Egypt. If I guess take a stand as an, um, a person independent on these two respective gentlemen. In my opinion, Quebec and the uh, Sphinx or Old King of Egypt uh, can't be compared. They are separated by millennia of history. It's different type of architecture. It's different type of culture, my opinion. And of course, we can't uh, expand on this topic as far as this moment because most of us, most of you, are not familiar with the issue. But take some time in the evening, look it up on Google, and you will see if there are common points, common characteristics in between these two places. And I leave it open to your judgment. The arguments uh, about the Sphinx made by Dr. Mark Lehner some years ago uh, was that the Sphinx couldn't possibly be 12,000 years old because there was no other site, no other megalithic site anywhere in the world which was anywhere in the range of 12,000 years old. Uh, when we have a major discovery conducted by a respected archaeological institute in Turkey of a major megalithic site which is 11,600 years old, I believe it vitiates that argument against an absence of context for the Sphinx, which is also uh, a megalithic monument. By the way, I have no argument with over the dating of the pyramids. Uh, it's the megalithic sites here at Giza that are of interest to me. Okay, thank you. So, um, <laughs> um, I think you can, you can see what we're, uh, what we're up against. Uh, notice the, the circular argument um, that the uh, the, the Czech archaeologist there is saying that there can't be a connection between the Sphinx and Gobekli Tepe because the Sphinx is much younger than Gobekli Tepe. But actually, that's the point at debate. Is the Sphinx much younger? You know, this is the way that Egyptology works again and again. A, a sort of argument by authority, an established paradigm is just put forward as though it were a fact when it may not be a fact. Okay, I have a massive presentation to give. I've been told by James that I can run over a wee bit if I need to because we're going into a break after this. So if you all walk out, it's okay, but I'll just carry on talking anyway. Um, 
I'm going to share with you some of the information that's going into my new book. It's called Magicians of the Gods. Uh, it's the sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods. It is a completely new book. It's not an update of Fingerprints of the Gods. It will be published here in the United States in November by St. Martin's Press. Uh, it is being published in Britain by Hodder and Stoughton on the 10th of September uh, with a different cover. Uh, where would you say that pyramid is, folks? It's in Indonesia. Um, it does look terribly like a Mexican pyramid. Uh, it looks a lot like uh, the Chichen Itza pyramid of Kukulkan, for example, but it's, uh, it's in Indonesia, uh, a few hours drive from Yogyakarta. Um, I, think it's, I think it's interesting that, uh, that we find pyramids all around the world. And I would suggest that in many cases what we're not looking at is a direct influence of one historical culture on another, but a remote common influence th that has passed down an idea uh, all around the world. Let's just jump over to Australia now um, and uh, realize that not all ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs are in uh, Egypt. Uh, this is a controversial site. It's called th these are called the Gosford Glyphs. And they are claimed uh, to be, they are claimed uh, to be a, a, a 20th century fraud. Uh, but if they are a fraud, it's curious that they tell a definite story. Um, they're rather roughly done, not as though they were done by the scribes who put hieroglyphs on temple walls, but as though they were done by people with a working knowledge of hieroglyphs uh, who weren't in the, the profession of creating hieroglyphs. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's an open mystery at the moment as to whether the Gosford glyphs are genuine uh, ancient Egyptian uh, glyphs or, or not. This is Indonesia, uh, and I'm with Danny Hillman Natwajija, who we'll be talking about later, who's the lead excavator of the very mysterious site of Gunung Padang. Uh, Danny and I did a big trip around Indonesia last summer, visiting megalithic sites uh, all around uh, Indonesia. Uh, at this one, at uh, Tugu Gede, uh, a statue has been found. This is the, this is the, the statue on the, on the side here, uh, which the local museum describes as uh, an image of Shiva, of the Indian god Shiva. But what it looks like to me is a, an ancient Egyptian headdress and an ancient Egyptian posture. Indeed, if you compare it with the positions of mummies um, in, uh, in ancient Egypt, it's very, very similar indeed. So the sense that there might have been ancient Egyptian voyages uh, to the Far East, uh, as far perhaps as Australia, cannot be written off. Not all megaliths are old. Uh, these megaliths are at Bori Parinding, megalithic site in Toraja, uh, in South Sulawesi in Indonesia, and none of them are more than 200 years old, and they're still making them today. Uh, they uh, go up to 20 tons in weight, and they haul them a distance of uh, seven or eight miles uh, from the quarry uh, to the site, and they showed me how the megaliths are made. I, I asked them, do you use uh, buffalo uh, to, to haul these 20-ton megaliths to the site? And they told me, no, um, we use 300 men, but afterwards we eat the buffalo. Um, <laughs> On the island of Flores, there are, in, again in Indonesia, there are a number of intriguing uh, megalithic sites which are, again, relatively recent. Uh, but some of them incorporate ancient uh, traditions, uh, such, as, such as this one, uh, where the local elders told me a story about a boat being washed up there more than 12,000 years ago, and the tradition of megaliths being passed down from that time. Uh, not everything that looks like a pyramid is a pyramid. Um, I, I'm very fond of Sam Osmanagic, who um, runs the Bo Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation. Uh, and I spent a few days in Bosnia with him last year. But I'm not at all convinced that this um, hill uh, is, a, is a pyramid. There are many hills that look like pyramids. Um, this one in Washington State, for example, or Black Pyramid Mountain in Montana, or Mount Kirvi in the Faroe Islands. So just the fact that it looks like a pyramid doesn't mean we have to automatically accept that it is a pyramid. However, um, what's interesting about the Pyramid of the Sun is that there are rather regular-looking blocks uh, on the side of it, which appear 
uh, at first sight to be to be made of concrete. Um, and I'm there with with Sam Osmanagic, uh, looking at these alleged concrete blocks. And if they were a man-made, an ancient concrete, that would be really interesting. Concrete goes back a long way, even in historical terms. The Romans were masters of concrete. They even made a concrete that would set under water for making harbors with. So the idea of an ancient concrete uh, shouldn't be dismissed completely. And there's a professor, Joseph Davidovitz, who has argued that all of the blocks of the Great Pyramid are made from a geopolymer, from a, from a concrete. And Joseph Davidovitz was asked to look at a sample which he initially thought was from here uh, and to pronounce as to whether it was concrete or not. Um, and I'll come to that in a moment. But I just want to make the point that nature also makes concretes. The Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun concretes are very like these pudding stones um, that we see in different natural formations all around the world. And it turns out that Joseph Davidovitz has withdrawn his support uh, from the alleged concrete blocks on the Pyramid of the Sun. Um, he is now saying that those are actually uh, pudding stone, that they're a natural conglomerate, and that they're not concrete at all. So Joseph Davidovitz cannot be used any longer to support the notion that the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun is um, a, a man-made concrete-covered structure. It turns out that the bit of concrete Davidovitz was shown uh, came from another place, this so-called Vratnica tumulus. Uh, and he does think that that is a man-made concrete, but he thinks it's probably Roman and belonged to uh, a Roman cistern. Nonetheless, there are some interesting blocks on the top of the Vratnica tumulus. They do certainly at first sight look quite man-made. Man but this ripple pattern in the top of them uh, is quite typically what you get in a sedimentary stone that forms at the bottom of a lake. And I think it's, it's unlikely that these are man-made blocks. Much more interesting at the site are the tunnels. Uh, many people are under the impression that these tunnels are actually in the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. Uh, but that is not the case. They are, they are about two to three kilometers away from the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. And they're called the Ravna Tunnels. And they are, uh, they are very intriguing. I don't know what they are. They don't seem very high tech to me. Um, but I do think that they're ancient and that they are being cleared out by Sam and his team. And they found some very interesting artifacts uh, inside them, which, uh, which include this, this uh, painting. Um, and uh, if genuine, it certainly does uh, add a new chapter to the history of, of Upper Paleolithic art, but I don't think it gives us uh, a lost civilization. I feel that much further work needs to be done in Bosnia. One of the problems is that Sam and his team have been stopped from, this is a, a recurrent problem in the world of alternative archaeology, they've been stopped from doing proper excavations in the Pyramid of the Sun, and that's really what's needed, is a thorough, detailed excavation of the site so that these question marks can be either put to rest or, or confirmed. Uh, if it is a man-made pyramid, then, then it absolutely rewrites history, and I think it's worth, it's worth investigating further rather than simply writing it off. I can only give you my honest opinion of it so far to the extent that I have seen it. Uh, not everything that looks like an alien spaceship uh, is an alien spaceship. Um, I'm referring to the images on the right-hand side of the screen. You see these jets of, look, look like jets of flame uh, shooting down from, from underneath a, uh, what could easily be construed as a flying saucer. Uh, and this was in Armenia, actually, up in the, up in the mountains. Uh, and the Armenians who I was with told me that they regularly have flying saucer sightings in that area. So I was very, very excited. Uh, however, was, when we began to look more closely, we realized that these are not images of uh, flying saucers at all. Actually, what they are is stylized images of uh, ibexes. Um, if I show you this one, you'll see what I'm getting at. Um, and uh, again, I just want to make the point that we shouldn't you know, leap to conclusions too quickly when something is tempting or intriguing. Uh, let's go to the Lebanon. And let's go to Baalbek, uh, which uh, has often been proclaimed as an ET land platform. The, uh, the argument for Baalbek being an ET landing platform is that we have, we're supposed to have this massive megalithic platform at Baalbek, 
which is so huge and so solid that it could take the weight of a shuttlecraft coming down from a spaceship uh, orbiting the Earth. Uh, so let's, let's test that out. Let's have a look at it. I think there is a huge mystery at Baalbek, but I don't think it's to do with aliens. Uh, I'm sitting in the middle of the Temple of Jupiter, uh, at Baalbek. Baalbek in its most recent incarnation is a Roman temple complex. Uh, and uh, as I'm sitting there uh, in the, what it was, what was called the cella of the Temple of Jupiter with the few remaining columns uh, behind me, I'm hearing heavy artillery uh, going off in the not too great distance and heavy machine gun fire because this is the Bekaa Valley and we are very, very close to the Syrian border. Um, but after a while you tune those sounds out, I managed to persuade myself that it was the Lebanese army doing some practice firing. I hope it was. Um, let me show you a plan of Baalbek, and it's over here on the left. You can see clearly marked the Temple of Jupiter, and the number 13 over those orange dots, those are the six remaining columns of the Temple of Jupiter that are standing. And it's the Temple of Jupiter that is supposed to be the platform uh, on which the alien craft uh, landed. So uh, to, to pick that up, the, there are the, three, the six columns there behind me, and um, uh, I'm sitting in the middle of the Temple of Jupiter. Change the angle now. I'm sorry, I can't point at all the screens at the same time, so I'll just have to point here. Uh, this photograph is taken from roughly here, and we're looking over at the Temple of Bacchus. It's great that the Romans had a temple dedicated to the wine god. Um, now we are looking down, um, we're looking up at the Temple of Jupiter from the area uh, in front of it. Again, those are the columns there. Now we're in the Temple of Jupiter looking down at the platform behind it. And the point I want to make is that it's very clear from the excavation that this is not a platform of megaliths. These are relatively small stones out of which this platform is made. Let's go back to the Temple of Jupiter uh, and uh, there are the six columns on the south side. This is north, that's west, that's east. Now let's look over the north wall of the Temple of Jupiter, and we start to see the real megalithic architecture. There is a huge U-shaped megalithic wall runs around the platform on which the Temple of Jupiter stands. Uh, you can see it here. There's that wall. And there is the platform of the Temple of Jupiter. Notice the wall is made of huge megaliths. The platform of the Temple of Jupiter is not made of huge megaliths. It's made of relatively small megaliths. That's the northern side of the megalithic wall. The southern side of the megalithic wall is over here on the other side of the temple. And again, it completely wraps around the temple. And the scale of the blocks of these megaliths is really quite stunning. We're looking at megaliths of about 450 tons here, and they are quite separate from the platform that is always attributed to be the platform that the aliens landed on. Uh, I want to make a point with this photograph. That's my wife, Santa, in one of the few photographs taken by me. Um, I want to make a point that the Romans were capable of moving very heavy stones. One of the mistakes we make in the alternative community is to say every time we see a heavy piece of stone, we think some kind of miracle has been performed or, or some sort of alien technology must be involved. But this is not the case. The Romans were perfectly capable of elevating blocks weighing three to 400 tons. In this case, this one uh, was raised th 360 tons, and it came from up there, uh, more than 60 feet uh, above the ground. So let's not pretend the Romans couldn't do this stuff, because they could. Um, Back again, looking at that north wall that wraps around the central platform. Here I'm standing by the edge of it for scale. And now let's go to the western wall. And this is the place that you hear about most often in ancient aliens. The, this is the Trilithon of Baalbek. Trilithon because it's three huge blocks of stone, each of which is about 60 feet long and each of which weighs around 900 tons. And they have been raised up 30 feet above the ground. Now in this picture, in the top photograph, I'm actually sitting on top of the southernmost of these blocks. I'm pointing the laser pointer at the block I'm sitting on, and there it, there it is. 
just to give you a sense of how it works, and to show you that these huge blocks are not part of the platform. They are separate from the platform. They surround it in a U shape all the way around it. And now again, uh, for scale, there I am, and I'm looking up at the three huge blocks of the trilithon. Do you see that black block by my foot just in front of my knee there? That is used as the killer argument by archaeologists for saying that the Romans made everything. That they made everything at Baalbek, not just the Temple of Jupiter, but the megalithic wall as well. I don't think it is a killer argument, but let me explain to you what's going on. Because there's that block excavated. And what that block is, is a fragment of a Roman temple column. That is one of the columns from the Temple of Jupiter, perhaps an offcut from one that was used as a block here. So the archaeologists say if we have a Roman temple column at the bottom, and then we have the megaliths above it, it's obvious that, and then we have a Roman temple on top, it's obvious that the Romans built everything. What they fail to take account of is that Baalbek was used as a fortress for the best part of 1,500 years during a period of enormous conflict, and its foundations were repeatedly undermined and repaired. And I think what we're looking at here is a repair block that was put there by Arabs who were defending that fortress against it being undermined. And indeed, we can see other places in a, in a definite uh, Arab wall. Uh, there's another Roman column used just here, uh, used in a repair which we know was definitely done by the Arabs. And so I don't think that this Roman column at the bottom of the megalithic wall is a killer argument at all uh, for that megalithic wall being the work of the Romans. I think the megalithic wall long predates the Romans by thousands and thousands of years. I think the temple is there because the site was sacred long before that. And here's where you get the really big blocks in the quarry. This one, <laughs> this bit of the quarry is actually being used as a rubbish dump today. But that's a 1,200 ton block of stone in the quarry. And here's another 1,200 ton block of stone. That's me standing on top of it there uh, in the quarry, nicely separated from the bedrock at the bottom. And just last June, the archaeologists, it's the German Archaeological Institute again, discovered a third block, and that's this one, which previously had been buried under sediment. And this third block weighs 1,450 tons. That's me standing on it there. Um, just discovered last June. It's been sitting there for God knows how long, and it was just discovered last June. And this is my point. If the Romans had been responsible for everything at Baalbek, if they had made the megalithic wall, if they had made, if they had cut these blocks, all three of them, and then found they couldn't move them, the Roman state of mind was very pragmatic. If they found they couldn't move them, they'd have sliced them up into smaller blocks and used them to build the further walls of the temple. They already had all the faces cut and cleared. Why would they just leave them there? I think the Romans didn't even know those blocks were there. I think those blocks were covered by sediment in Roman times. And I think that, uh, for me, this is the, the strongest proof that the Trilithon, which is definitely the same architecture as these blocks, is very much pre-Roman. And I think it may be much more than 10,000 years pre-Roman. It's a sign of advanced knowledge in prehistoric times. It is not a sign, in my view, of alien intervention. Uh, if we go to the Giza Plateau, uh, we uh, can find other signs of advanced knowledge. This is just to show you that Lebanon and, and Egypt are really very close together. Uh, for example, the Great Pyramid is aligned to within 3 sixtieths of a degree of true north, of astronomical north. Uh, to do that on a monument with a 13-acre footprint weighing 6 million tons uh, is an incredible achievement. It's an, it's an incredible achievement. However, if you could navigate interstellar space, if you could get to this pale blue dot across interstellar space, I think you'd get your Great Pyramid exactly on true north. Uh, this is human error, in my view, but it's very small human error, uh, and it's uh, an, an astonishing technical achievement. The Great Pyramid also stands on latitude 30, which is one-third of the way between the equator and the North Pole. 
Uh, Egyptologists know about this, but they say it's a coincidence. Um, this is the precession of the equinoxes, supposedly caused by a wobble on the axis of the Earth. The Earth's the viewing platform from which we observe the stars. Since it's changing its orientation, the patterns of the stars in the sky change their orientation as well. And this unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. And there's an amazing study called Hamlet's Mill, done by Professor Giorgio de Santigliana of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Hertha von Deschend of Frankfurt University, which argues that knowledge of precession of the equinoxes goes back thousands and thousands of years into prehistory, and that what they describe as some almost unbelievable ancestor civilization had observed this phenomenon. It's very difficult to observe. One degree is like the width of your forefinger held up to the horizon. And that's the amount of change every 72 years, just the width of your forefinger held up to the horizon. So you have to be observing the skies for a long time to get this and to get it accurately and to measure it. One degree every 72 years is difficult. And part of the evidence that Santillana and von Deschen produce is the presence in myth all around the world of a series of numbers that are derived from the precession of the equinoxes, numbers based on the number 72. For example, uh, some of the myths are, are indicated here. If you take 72 and add half of 72 to it, if you add 36 to 72, you get 108. And if you divide 108 by 2, you get 54. So we find it, for example, at Angkor, where the there are 54 figures on either side of this uh, bridge at Angkor Thom. And what they're doing is actually churning the milky ocean, which Santidiana and von Deschen take as a symbol for the precession of the equinoxes. And by the way, that Roman temple also had 54 columns. These numbers, which are all derived from the number 72, 30 times 72 is 2,160, for example, found in myths all around the world, very, very ancient, and Santillana and von Deschen going, believe going back to uh, a remote common source. That same number system, 72, based on the number 72, is found in the ratio between the pyramid and the Earth. If you take the height of the Great Pyramid and uh, multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. And if you measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. In other words, the dimensions of our planet are encoded in the Great Pyramid on a scale derived from a motion of the planet itself, the precession of the equinoxes. This cannot be uh, an accident, in my view. So you might well ask why I'm showing you a photograph of the Hoover Dam. Uh, well, I'm showing you a photograph of the Hoover Dam because the Hoover Dam also incorporates processional astronomy. Uh, there is a piece of sculpture and artwork at the Hoover Dam, and Oscar Hansen, who was responsible for this star map uh, set in the floor of the monument, believed that in remote ages to come, intelligent people with knowledge of precession would be able to discern the astronomical time of the dam's dedication. So this is to say, you know, if you want to pass a mess, I mean, actually, who gives a damn when the Hoover Dam was built? But if you want to pass a message to the future, you might be unwise to entrust it to a written human language because in 10,000 years from now, nobody might speak that language. What you want to do is use gigantic architecture and something universal, the mathematics of the heavens. And in that way, you can use astronomy and architecture to spell out a date. And that brings us to the Giza Plateau and the very image that caused Zahi Hawass to walk out of our debate. Uh, because this is the sky at the spring equinox of the epoch from 12,800 years ago to 11,600 years ago. Uh, and this is, uh, this is derived from a diagram in a book that Robert Boval and I wrote together called Keeper of Genesis in the UK and called Message of the Sphinx uh, here in America. And uh, this is the moment that the sun splits the horizon at dawn on the spring equinox. And we see the belt of Orion represented by the pyramids of the on the ground and the lion-bodied sphinx represented by the constellation of Leo uh, in the sky. And this only happens once every 26,000 years. Now, our Egyptological opponents and their, a few of their astronomer friends 
uh, tried to argue that the, the Orion correlation doesn't work uh, because the Orion correlation is upside down. This is a very ridiculous thing to say, actually. Uh, I believe Robert Boval's Orion correlation is one of the signal contributions to our understanding of ancient Egypt. Uh, and it infuriates me that people attempt to dismiss it by arguing that it's upside down. Of course it's not upside down. That's what the constellation of Orion looks like. And these are various ways that it's depicted, even in a tattoo, you know, there's the, the three stars of the belt um, shown in that, in that tattoo. Here is the argument that astronomers use to say that the correlation is upside down. It's a modern astronomical convention that the sky curves over your head, okay? It's a dome curving over your head. So if you stand looking south, the higher up in the sky you get, the further north you get. Do you follow? And therefore they're saying, since this, the highest star actually represents the southernmost pyramid, that it's upside down. But what we're saying is, it's not about that at all. If you actually were an artist and you tried to draw Orion's belt, and then you place your drawing on the ground, you get exactly what we see at Giza. And if you did it the way the astronomers want us to do it, it wouldn't look uh, anything like Orion's belt or Giza. Uh, so what we're saying is that this is an accurate image in three dimensions on the ground of the three stars of Orion's belt. And even Ed Krupp, uh, our greatest critic um, admits that according to the pyramid text, the pharaoh rose to the stars as Orion. Uh, Egyptian astronomy recognized Orion, at least his belt, as the celestial incarnation of the god Osiris. This is an important point. Orion is not simply any old constellation. For the ancient Egyptians, it was the god Osiris in the heavens. Um, and Robert makes a number of points here. Did the pyramid builders have a keen interest in the stars? Yes, they did. Do the pyramids have astronomical qualities in their design? Yes, they do. Is there a feature in the pyramid that links them to Orion's belt? Yes, there is. This is the southern shaft of the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid. Are there contemporary or near contemporary texts associated with the pyramids in that region which speak of a link to Orion? Yes. Did the ancient Egyptians imagine pyramids to be stars? Yes, they did. The Zawiyat al Aryan pyramid is called the Pyramid of Nebka, is a star. Abu Ruash pyramid was called the Pyramid of Jedifre, is a Sehed star, and so on and so forth. Uh, and from the, the above, we have to conclude that there's much that suggests a deliberate intention to represent Orion's belt at Giza. Um, we read in the pyramid text about Osiris coming as Orion, about the king reaching the sky as Orion. The sky conceives you with Orion. And Salim Hassan, a great Egyptologist, noted decades ago that I think it cannot possibly de be denied that at one period in their history, the Egyptians believed that the souls of their kings either mingled with the stars or became a star. And this tradition never entirely died out. Now, it's interesting that some of the stellar connections of the Great Pyramid are accepted by Egyptologists. They accept the stellar con connections that fit the existing paradigm. So Virginia Trimble and Alexander Badawi, back in, back in the 1960s, uh, were the first to point out that the southern shaft of the king's chamber targeted the lowest of the three stars of Orion's belt in the epoch when the pyramids are supposed to have been built, around about 2500 BC. So Egyptology embraced this as a, as a fact. Um, and Robert Boval came along and showed other connections with Beta Ursa Minor, with Alpha Draconis, with Sirius, with the other three shafts. And all of them at the date when the pyramids are supposed to have been made, around about 2500 BC. But then there's this problem which is the way the monuments are laid out on the ground. And those spell out another date. The great sphinx, this lion-bodied sphinx, at dawn on the spring equinox, this is what it would look at. It would look at the constellation of Leo, its celestial counterpart, rising uh, in the heavens. And about an hour passes, and the gears of the heavens lock, and the constellation of Orion south and lies due south on the meridian, exactly in the pattern of the three pyramids on the ground, as you view it visually, not upside down at all. 
Um, and therefore, what Giza appears to us to represent is the sky of the epoch from 12,800 years ago to 11,600 years ago. But it's complicated because there are other aspects of the site that speak very strongly to the period of 4,500 years ago, 2,500 BC. Uh, let's go into this a little further. Um, there is the Milky Way, which of course is a prominent feature in that sky ground diagram. Uh, and as we know, there's our sun sitting in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way, and we're involved in an orbit around the center of the galaxy. And this orbit, this huge 250 million year orbit around the center of the galaxy, isn't a simple flat orbit. The solar system does a maneuver rather like a dolphin diving up and down through the galactic plane. Uh, at 30 million to 35 million year intervals. It dives up and down, and when it passes through the galactic plane, it passes through stuff. There's, there's matter there, and it can disrupt uh, things in our cosmic environment. And it's now being recognized that this uh, journey of our solar system around the center of the galaxy uh, may be responsible for sending comets and asteroids uh, across the Earth's path. Um, what we're looking at here is a whole bunch of astonished dinosaurs. <laughs> and they're, they're astonished because they're witnessing the end of dino world. It's stopping right there, right then, 65 million years ago the so-called KT event when a 10 kilometer wide asteroid smacks into the Gulf of Mexico and results in the extinction of the dinosaurs. Lewis and Walter Alvarez, who first proposed that this was a, an asteroid or comet impact, were subjected to more than a decade of ferocious attacks by their colleagues. I can't tell you how many reports appeared in the academic press saying that the theory that the dinosaurs had been made extinct by an asteroid had been absolutely debunked. There were requiems for it. The theory was completely wrong. It was false. But guess what? The theory was 100% right. And as time went by, the rest of science has accepted this, and the crater has even now been identified, the Chicxulub structure in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's something odd in science where if you propose a cataclysmic mechanism, you can expect to have um, all of your arguments and your personality and your integrity attacked by the scientific establishment, sometimes for decades. So dinosaur extinction and the asteroid impact are absolutely accepted. This is the end of part one of this fascinating presentation by Graham Hancock. Stay tuned, part two will begin in 60 seconds, immediately after this brief message. Graham Hancock will be a featured speaker at the Earth Keeper Crystal Vortex Gathering in Hot Springs National Park in the beautiful mountains of Arkansas, November 20th through 23rd, 2015. Other featured speakers include James Tiberon, William Henry, John Van Orken, Dr. Andrew Collins, Hugh Newman, Dr. Roman Gokul MD, Dr. Jerry Castronova, Linda Robinson, Catherine Cominos, Ariel Faith Michael, Joanne Parks and Max, Michelle No Cyrano and Shana Ra. For more information about the Earthkeeper 2015 conference in Arkansas, or to register for the Arkansas Earthkeeper event visit our website at www.earthkeeper.com. And now the second portion of Graham Hancock's brilliant presentation. Enjoy. In our immediate cosmic environment, um, we have a couple of places where comets originate. One is the Oort cloud, and the other is the Kuiper belt. Uh, these are wrapped around the solar system, and uh, as you can imagine, as we pass up and down through the galactic plane, it's possible for these sources of comets to be disrupted, and occasionally for comets to be sent in into the inner solar system. Uh, and comets are not, by any means, just dirty snowballs. Um, there is an ancient fear of comets, 
and I would, which is typified in this cartoon. Uh, and I would say that that ancient fear is based on something very solid, some kind of memory that associates comets with uh, cataclysms. They're certainly not dirty snowballs. Uh, this comet, uh, Comet 67P, photographed by the Rosetta probe, uh, is about five kilometers uh, in length, but giant comets can exceed 200 kilometers in diameter. And just as an aside here, it's really weird what's going on with 67P. Uh, so the, 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 the probe is the Rosetta probe. The lander is the Philae lander. Those are both from ancient Egypt, right? The Rosetta stone, the temple of Isis at Philae. Then they home in on this particular area, which they call the Aker region of the comet. Aker was an ancient Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian deities of the horizon. Um, and what do they find there, if not three huge standing stones? I don't know what to make of it. I'm not making anything of it. I just share it with you in passing. Let's scale that comet up till it's uh, 50 kilometers wide. And that's what it looks like in relation to Los Angeles. But you can have comets that are 200 kilometers in diameter, and comets frequently disintegrate. They break into multiple fragments, some of which may be very large. I think most of us remember Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, uh, which hit Jupiter in 1994. Do you remember that? Uh, and the, the coverage of it and how it broke into this freight train of glowing fragments and how the fragments eventually collided massively with the planet Jupiter. Uh, if any of those fragments had hit the Earth, we would not be here today. Our planet would have been sterilized by those impacts. Uh, and this is the moment to say, thank you, Jupiter. Because Jupiter is the giant guardian of our planet, circulating in the outer solar system with its huge gravity. It draws in most of the comets that would threaten life on Earth. But occasionally, uh, comets do get through. Uh, actually, the Earth is being hit by small astronomical objects all the time. This is, uh, but they call them bolide events, small asteroids that disintegrated in Earth's atmosphere between 1994 and 2013. They're just shooting stars. We don't worry about them too much. They're pretty lights in the sky. Uh, but it's just to tell us that the cosmic environment is just a little bit, a little bit dangerous from time to time. Um, the general view is that objects like the asteroid that destroyed, that, that made the dinosaurs extinct, hit the Earth about once every hundred million years. So if that's true, if these are hundred million year intervals, then we don't have to worry much about comets and asteroids that could be Earth killers. Uh, and certainly we don't need to take them into account in the story of human history. Uh, so this is now where I have to disagree with my colleague Robert Schock on the issue of the comet. Uh, Robert uh, su suggested, uh, and, and indeed he has his reasons to do so, uh, that the story of a comet impact 12,800 years ago on the Earth has been discredited. Uh, this, uh, according to, I, I've spent a great deal of time on this subject, and it's, it, it's the focus of a huge section in my new book, and I've worked with the academics who are dealing with the story of the comet impact 12,800 years ago. They're very major figures. There's actually 28 of them. They include James Kennett, who's a professor at the University of California, uh, Santa Barbara, Richard Firestone, Nuclear Science Division, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, James Whitke at the School of Earth Sciences, Albert Goodyear, South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology. They're a multidisciplinary team. And since 2007, together, by the way, with astronomers. So Fred Hoyle has passed away now, uh, but Bill Napier is still active, and they are, they're comparing notes with astronomers on all of this. And the argument is that a comet did hit the Earth uh, 12,800 years ago, several fragments of it, as a matter of fact. Now, it's interesting if you study catastrophism, it's interesting to look at what happens to it. Whenever a catastrophic mechanism is proposed, it is absolutely the norm for the academic community to attack that and to attempt to discredit the individuals who are proposing it. This has happened again and again and again. And this has happened with the, what is called the Younger Dryas Comet, that there have been multiple attempts to refute the hypothesis. Um, every single one of those refutations 
has been refuted by the team working on the comet impact. And they have shown that the refutations are lacking in substance. Nevertheless, the refutations get picked up by the popular media. And you might see a headline saying, a comet didn't hit the Earth after all. I would say hold your judgment on this, because there is a, there is a very, very serious and detailed academic work has gone into this over the last eight years. And it's not going away. It's getting stronger and stronger. The evidence for the comet is becoming very powerful indeed. And another issue is raised. Robert, Robert mentioned the problem of the global warming 11,600 years ago and how that couldn't be explained by a comet. But actually, Fred Hoyle, going back some time now, did explain exactly how it could be caused by a comet. Uh, that the first impacts 12,800 years ago were on ice. They were on the North American ice cap. That's why we don't find immediately craters, because the ice was two miles deep. It caused a massive meltdown of the ice. That meltwater went into the world ocean, disrupted ocean circulation, and plunged the world into the cold period that we call the Younger Dryas. Other fragments of the comet remained aloft, and 11,600 years ago, second encounter with the debris stream of the comet. On that occasion, the impacts were into oceans. Huge amounts of water vapor were thrown up into the upper atmosphere, creating a greenhouse effect, and thus creating the warming that occurred 11,600 years ago. I'm very interested in the cor coronal mass ejection work that Robert's doing, and, and I have great respect for everything that Robert does. Um, I just think that the universe can chew gum and, and walk at the same time, you know. It's possible, that, it's possible that the fact that there were coronal mass ejections doesn't have to mean we have to completely get rid of the notion of a comet, particularly since there were, uh, the, since the work on the comet. And I'm just going to show you some of the papers here. This one is one of the first papers from 9th of October 2007 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Be clear, these are very serious, very courageous academics who are putting this work forward. And their evidence is utterly compelling. And every time that an attempt has been made to refute their evidence, they have refuted the refutation. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences again in 2009. Um, here we have the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, Bill Napier, whose photograph I showed you, uh, showing how this is the disintegration, the downstream result of a disintegrating giant comet. Um, a whole series of, of pieces in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences here. Uh, these are called impact proxies, where you don't have a crater, you look for other things. When a comet hits the Earth at 60 or 100,000 miles an hour, you get heat and you get shock. So you get things like nanodiamonds being formed. You get microspherules being formed. You get melt glass being formed. And they're finding this all around the world. Here's the most recent uh, paper, but I know for a fact they have two more papers coming out this year which will, which will further reinforce the case. Nanodiamond rich layer across three continents consistent with major cosmic impact at 12,800 years before the present. This is the Journal of Geology, 5th of September, 2014. And here is Jim Kennett, uh, one of those, uh, uh, one of the 28 uh, co-authors of this work. Uh, and he, what he's pointing out is that the megafauna extinctions in North America, which took place soon after 12,800 years ago, are most likely connected to this comet impact. Now it's interesting, there's something else that needs to be looked at. We have evidence of gigantic flooding in North America, uh, mostly in Washington state. Um, and this flooding has for a long time been attributed to the outspill of glacial lakes. There was a glacial lake here called Glacial Lake Missoula. And the argument is that its ice dam broke and the water spilled out of the lake and created the extraordinary features of the Channel Scablands. Um, I have reason to believe that a new theory is going to be coming forward. And this has a lot to do with the work of a good friend and colleague of mine called Randall Carlson, uh, but also with the Younger Dryas Comet team. You see, the Younger Dryas Comet evidence, those impact proxies, are found in this huge fingerprint around the world. Epicenter is North America, but you get impacts as far afield as uh, Syria uh, and into South America as well. But it's North America where the epicenter is, and the impacts are on ice. And the ice at that point is two miles deep. 
So any crater would be in the ice. The ice then melts, the crater is gone. But you do get shock effects on the ground, and they are beginning to find remnant craters at a number of places uh, around the North American continent. I highly recommend a visit to the channeled scablands, to the Columbia Basalt Plateau. Randall Carlson and I spent several weeks driving around that area last fall, and it's just the most incredible area, particularly features like Upper and Lower Grand Coulee, which uh, is, is just this huge gouge out of the earth, as though somebody has taken a, a chisel and just chiseled out a 30 or 40 mile long ditch in the earth that's hundreds and hundreds of meters deep. And actually, that was all caused by floodwaters, and it was all caused in just two weeks. Two weeks of extraordinary flooding cut that out and created this feature, which is called Dry Falls. Has anybody been to Dry Falls? Go, honestly. America has just got the most amazing things going on. This is Dry Falls. I'm there with Randall Carlson. That's the foot of Dry, that's the base of Dry Falls. And that's what Niagara Falls look like in comparison with Dry Falls. Dry Falls is five times bigger than Niagara Falls. Thing is, Niagara Falls has taken 12,000 years to create. Dry Falls was created in two weeks by gigantic flooding at the end of the Ice Age. Look at this uh, landscape, the Camas Prairie. You can see ancient shorelines there. And in the foreground, ripples. Those ripples, you get the sense of the scale with these cars there. They're 50 feet high and hundreds of feet long. They were caused by floodwaters receding at exactly this time, 12,800 years ago. You get gigantic boulders like this one, which weighs 18,000 tons up above Wenatchee. How did it get there? It got there in an iceberg. Floodwaters came ripping down off the ice cap, carrying icebergs. Some of those icebergs were filled with boulders. One of them here, 500 feet above the valley floor, grounded against the valley side. The ice melted away, and we have this huge glacial erratic there. And in fact, there's fields of these glacial erratics. It's a cataclysmic landscape. Some extraordinary event took place there, and the multiple emptyings of Lake Missoula simply will not cut it to explain the channeled scablands, uh, to explain, explain the landscape features that we see there. And this is a extinctions in North America. 73% in North America and 79% of all extinctions in the last 100,000 years took place between 10,000 and 12,000 years ago, exactly in the time that the comet impact is hypothesized. Um, and this is a chart of the Younger, the younger Dryas. This is what I, what I call the punctuation mark of the Younger Dryas, 12,800 years ago to 11,600 years ago. As Robert said this morning, the world was getting warmer during the Ice Age, and then suddenly, 12,800 years ago, it went into this incredible cold snap, and then it came out of it again 11,600 years ago. The Earth warmed up very, very rapidly. Uh, and everything that we're taught about the story of human civilization happens after the Younger Dryas. And nobody's really taking account of what might have happened before it. Uh, and I'm taking the view that um, the house of history is built on sand. Actually, most of the stuff that historians and archaeologists say about the last nine or 10,000 years is good. But the foundations upon the, which they build it are bad because, whoops, they forgot to take account of an extinction level event that occurred on this planet 12,800 years ago. An event quite big enough, whatever it was caused by, whether it was caused by a comet or by coronal mass ejections, let's do the research, let's get deeper into it to find out the final answer. That what we all agree on is that the period from 12,800 years ago to 11,600 years ago was an extinction level period. It was a dramatic global cataclysm. It changed the face of the earth. And if we're looking for a lost civilization, that's the place we should be looking, in that window. Let's go over to Indonesia. That's how Indonesia looked during the last ice age there, the Sunda Shelf. That's a huge continent-sized landmass. And Australia was much bigger too, the Sahul. Australia joined to New Zealand. Um, and then what happens is 
20,000 years ago, you have this continent-sized landmass, well watered with amazing river systems inside it that are now under the sea. And then, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, it all goes underwater. Sea level rises radically, and we see Indonesia as it looks today. Now, um, go to Java and go to Bandung and drive three hours west, and you will come to Gunung Padang. Uh, Gunung Padang uh, is a site that's been known about for quite a long time, since about 1914, actually. And it's thought, it was thought to be about 2,500 years old. Uh, it's a megalithic site, obviously. It's actually made of a natural material called columnar basalt. But the columnar basalt has been used as a building block, uh, as building blocks by whoever made this megalithic site. Uh, and uh, I'm just just to show you a around the site a little bit more, a few more, a few more images of how it looks, the very top of the site. And I'm there again with Danny Hillman, um, the Nat Natawajaja, who is the the geologist the um, Caltech-trained PhD geologist who is doing the work at Gunung Padang. Um, I'll just show you a few more pictures of it, and then let's pull back and look at Gunung Padang, look at actually what it is. That megalithic site is on t something, which for a long time was thought to be a natural hill. And all of the archaeological work, such as it was, and it was minimal, had only been done on the top, on these terraces. And nobody was paying any attention to what went on down below, except Danny Hillman. By the way, he, his middle name is Hillman because when his mother was rushed to hospital in labor with him, they were driving in a Hillman car. Um, <laughs> Danny Hillman Natuwajaja. Uh, he decided that he would take a look at that odd-looking hill from a geological point of view using the latest geological tech. And they did a thorough investigation of it uh, using seismic tomography, using electrical imaging, um, getting a look inside it. And what they discovered is that it is, in fact, a man-made pyramid with multiple chambers inside it, and the megalithic site on top is just the latest stage of a very long development at Gunung Padang. They did some drilling using tubular drills, drilling down drill cores into the depths of the pyramid, and they started pulling up man-made artifacts and carbon-datable organic material, and they started getting very ancient dates, going back 16,000 years and more. There's the date at the top, 2,500 years before the present, but then we go back further, 28,000 years, 23,000 years, 13,000 years. And they're also finding very high resistivity bodies inside the Gunung Padang pyramid, which are chambers, regular chambers. Uh, and in fact, there are three of them which have been identified. So naturally, this is a very tempting place for an archaeological investigation. You would have thought, after the geologists had opened the road, that the archaeologists would really want to get in there and dig. Instead, what they did was they created a huge amount of trouble for Danny and his team, and they said, look, we know this site is 2,500 years old. There is absolutely no point in doing any further investigation of it at all. The funds for that would be much better used on our projects. And Danny and his team were stopped for the best part of a year until in uh, December 2013, Danny succeeded in bringing the then president of Indonesia, President Yudhoyono, to Gunung Padang and showed him the site and showed him the evidence. And Yudhoyono said, you know what? You go ahead and excavate this site. Don't listen to those archaeologists. It took a while to get it going, but they started excavating in August 2014. Immediately, there was an outcry from archaeologists. Um, here's Bandung Archaeological Center head Desriel Shanti has taken issue with the excavation process being carried out at Gunung Padang 
adding that the process had not followed standard methods. I've yet to go to the site, she says, but I can judge it from photographs. Again, this is the kind of thing that we're up against. Here's the problem. President Yudo Yono stepped down at the beginning of October, and President Widodo took over, and the excavation was immediately stopped. And that's where we're at at the moment. The excavation stopped on the 1st of October. Uh, Danny and his team are still working to get the excavation restarted. He wrote to me on the 2nd of October that the research progress has been great. They've uncovered lots more stone artifacts. The existence of the pyramid-like structure beneath the megalithic site is now loud and clear. We found some kind of open hall buried by soil five to seven meters thick, but we haven't got into it yet. And they still haven't got into it because they've been cleared off the site. Sometimes, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but sometimes I wonder if there's some kind of conspiracy going on to prevent us knowing the truth about our past. Go around Indonesia. Danny and Santa and myself did a huge trip around Indonesia. There's just amazing, unexplained megalithic monuments all over the Indonesian islands. Uh, I'm going to put these two pictures. Um, th th here is a, a megalithic tomb. Uh, a painted megalithic tomb with gigantic blocks. And I'll just run these next two pictures very quickly because I want to show you the bat. You see the bat? Whoops. <laughs> I screamed, I have to confess. <laughs> Santa kept pressing the button, but I, I, I was shocked. Um, the paintings in that megalithic chamber are very like these paintings that have recently been found in Indonesia. 40,000 year old rock art in Indonesia rewrites history. The, it used to be thought that the oldest rock art in the world was Europe going back 39 or 40,000 years. Now they found it in Indonesia. And they keep on finding new things in Indonesia. You remember the, the Hobbit, the Homo, Homo floresiensis, uh, the Pleistocene cave art. Here's the oldest engraving, half a million years old, has just been found in Indonesia. Indonesia looks to me like the kind of place where the next turn of the archaeologist spade will reveal a lost civilization. Uh, let us go over to Micronesia and to Ponape in Micronesia. Ponape and the site called Nan Madol. Interestingly, Nan Madol is made of the same kind of stuff as Gunung Padang. And Nan Madol is thought by mainstream archaeology to be about a thousand years old. But Nan Madol sits on the edge of the Pacific Ocean. And if you put on your diving gear and get in that ocean and start going down and down, you start finding really interesting things at about 110 to 120 feet underwater on the bottom of the sea. Huge columns. This one, fallen, is particularly like uh, this column from the island of Tinian, not very far away. And we know from its depth of immersion that this one has been underwater for more than 12,000 years. It suggests that we may need to redate other megalithic sites as well, uh, like Tinian. I'm not going to go at length into Yonaguni here. I and Santa did more than 200 dives there. Uh, a lot of people think it's natural. Um, I believe it's a, it's a man-made site. There are megalithic sites all over Japan above water, including stone circles, and there are stone circles underwater in Japan. These stone circles are at Kerama off Okinawa. They're 110 feet underwater, and I have yet to find a geologist who is able to tell me how this was done naturally. This is definitely cut out of solid bedrock uh, by human agency, the way that the inner curve of the outer megalith matches the outer curve of the central megalith. We'll quickly run over to India, southeast India. Santa and I have dived here and here, Pumpahar and Mahabalapuram. Uh, there is a U-shaped man-made structure. I apologize for the visibility. The Indian waters are filled with uh, floating solids. Um, but uh, you can see that there are man-made blocks on the seabed here. Uh, they've been there for more than 12,000 years. Mahabalipuram, the uh, shore temples carved out of solid rock at Mahabalipuram. Oddly enough, this was the place where I learned to swim as a child at the age of five years old. My dad was a medical missionary in India. Um, there is uh, the rock-hewn temples. There are the fishermen. Santa's first language is Tamil. 
these are Tamil fishermen. We got talking to them. They told us that there is a whole city underwater off the coast of Mahabalipuram. Um, it took us two years to get permission, but eventually we got together with the Scientific Exploration Society in Britain, led by Sir John Blashford Snell, and we put together, as you can see, a very high-tech expedition uh, to go diving off Mahabalipuram at the points where the fishermen said the city was. And it turned out they were right, uh, that there is a whole city on the seabed going out as much as five kilometers from shore off the coast of Mahabalipuram and uh, down to depths of 120 feet where we know it's been submerged for 12,000 plus years. After we made that discovery, we were forbidden to do any further work. Uh, it seemed there was embarrassment that foreigners had been involved in a, a major marine archaeological discovery in India. Um, the National Institute of Oceanography took it over but did nothing until the Boxing Day tsunami emptied out the bay in front of Mahabalipuram for half an hour and everybody saw the ruins and nobody could deny it anymore. Some work is being done now but only in the intertidal zone, not out at great depths. Up in the northwest, the Gulf of Cam Bay, side scan sonar reveals regular structures at a depth of 40 meters, 130 feet underwater. This site has never been dived on and since those structures were revealed, again, mysteriously, no further work has been done on the site. I'm interested in this Piri Reis map. I don't want to talk to you about Antarctica. I want to talk to you about this island up here uh, off the coast of North America. Remember, the, uh, the map is drawn by the British Admiral in 1513. He says on the map in his own handwriting that he based it on more than 100 older source maps, which were falling to pieces because they were so badly damaged and so ancient. He incorporated them into a world map. We've lost most of the world map except for this fragment. That's West Africa, that's South America, that's North America. But this island is what intrigues me because running up the middle of the island, can you see this row of megaliths which run up the very center of the island there? Well, that island is exactly where the Bimini Road is. And that's the Bimini Road. And <laughs> it's been underwater for thousands of years, so how do we explain the appearance of those megaliths above water on that, on that island? There's my book, Fingerprints of the Gods, published in 1995. I had absolutely no idea the storm of fury that it was going to bring down on my head. My great crime uh, was not to publish a book of alternative history, but to publish a book of alternative history that was successful. If the book had failed, the archaeologists would have been very happy and they would have ignored me. But because it didn't fail, it did get noticed. Their students decided asking them questions. I came in for a lot of attacks. And one of the magazines, Friends with Archaeologists, that attacked me most forcefully was a British magazine called New Scientist. Now, my claim in Fingerprints of the Gods is that civilization is older and more mysterious than we thought. And that's why they attacked me. So when they published this cover in 2013, uh, I was very happy. Civilization is older and more mysterious than we thought, new scientist admits. And they're forced to admit it because, of course, of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, Gobekli Tepe with its huge megalithic pillars. Um, and that is Klaus Schmidt, the German archaeologist who sadly passed away a few months ago, who I'm standing talking to in this, in this picture with the pillars uh, behind us. And the point that Klaus Schmidt made to me, again, we've, we've seen with Robert this morning how Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried. And the deliberate burial of the site, like a time capsule, sealed it. Most other megalithic sites have been tramped over by later cultures again and again and again. You see, you can't date the stone itself. You have to date organic material associated with the stone. And the problem is that with a megalithic site that has been, if you like, contaminated by later cultures, you can get the intrusion of much younger carbon. And that can give you a falsely young date. What's special about Gobekli Tepe is it was sealed. There's no possibility of a falsely young date. And the oldest date so far found at Gobekli Tepe is 9,600 BC, 11,600 years ago. 
And that is fascinating, as Robert pointed out this morning, because 11,600 years ago isn't just a random date. It is actually the end of the Ice Age. It's the end of the Younger Dryas and the beginning of that huge warming spell. It's a very significant date. So just uh, a few shots of Gobekli Tepe. There I'm standing on uh, one of the pillars of Gobekli Tepe that uh, was left in the quarry because they found a, a fault in it. This one would have weighed actually 50 tons uh, if they'd put it up. Now, ask yourself this. This is the paradigm, okay? You're supp this is supposed to have been a, a civilization of hunter-gatherers. Um, uh, hunter-gatherers, uh, therefore the word civilization doesn't apply, as that Egyptologist told us. Um, hunter-gatherers, and they wake up one morning and they decide that they're going to create a gigantic megalithic site. It's not just like Stonehenge, it's like 50 times Stonehenge. They're going to align it to the stars, they're going to erect 20 or 30 ton pillars, and they're, all going, to, they're going to do it without any previous practice or, or explanation, uh, explication at all. I say it's 50 times bigger, I'm talking to Klaus Schmidt here, and the reason he's pointing so vehemently at the ground is that that's what the ground penetrating radar shows, that the, the, the four big circles that they've excavated so far are just a tiny fraction of what's there, and that there is about 50 times as much still under the ground, still waiting to be excavated. And right now, the German archaeological... Can you believe this? They don't have the money to excavate it. They're going to actually close the excavation down in a few years. I, I don't understand this at all. Um, but not only that, Klaus said, the, uh, <laughs> he said, they invented megalithic architecture. And they invented agriculture. Because that's the other thing that happened suddenly at Gobekli Tepe at around that time. Bang, they're making megalithic architecture. Bang, they're making agriculture. You know what it looks like to me? It looks like a transfer of technology. It looks like some people came there, some folk came there to Gobekli Tepe who already knew everything you need to know to make megalithic architecture. They already knew about agriculture. They used it as a center of innovation and training, and they transferred technology to the local hunter-gatherer population who then set off on the road to civilization. Gobekli Tepe isn't alone. This is Karahan Tepe. It is about 60 kilometers away. It has not even been excavated yet, and we are looking at the same T-shaped pillars sticking out of the ground. Goodness knows what story is going to be revealed about our past when the full excavation of this area is done. I have to point out, Gobekli Tepe is in the area of historic Armenia. Um, I discovered this when I first started writing about Gobekli Tepe, and lots of furious Armenians wrote to me, and they said that it was really wrong of me to credit Turkey with Gobekli Tepe, uh, because Gobekli Tepe belonged to historic Armenia. Um, and it's a very sad thing that happened in Armenia. Uh, the Armenian genocide, which just passed its 100th anniversary, uh, saw the murder of two million people. Uh, uh, a massacre for which Turkey has not yet apologized. It, it causes great pain to Armenians uh, who are left with a tiny rump of a country. Uh, from Armenia, you can see Mount Ararat, but Mount Ararat now is in Turkey. It's the national symbol of Armenia. Uh, and Armenia is filled with um, amazing megalithic sites. I did my first research trip there last year I uh, was particularly struck by Karahunj, the Armenian Stonehenge, with its astronomical alignments going back more than 12,000 years. Um, and uh, I also lead tours, and if anybody would like to join me in Armenia, uh, I will be going there for a short trip with a very small group for about 10 days, um, and it'll be a, an opportunity to explore that country. If you just go to the talks and events page on my website, you'll find the link. Now... I mentioned to you other megalithic sites and how we might need to rethink their dating. For example, if we go to the Balearic Islands, to Menorca, uh, we can find T-shaped megaliths, which are only thought to be three or 4,000 years old, but they're very similar to the Gobekli Tepe megaliths. Maybe we need to rethink the age of those megaliths on Menorca. And again, if we look at the general pattern of Gobekli Tepe, Compare it to the general pattern of the huge megalithic temples of Malta, which are thought to be about 5,000 years old. Maybe the Maltese temples are much older as well. 
Uh, and of course, that brings us, as, as Robert did so thoroughly this morning, to the Sphinx and the question of the age of the Sphinx, because now uh, we do have a context. John Anthony West, who first spotted the anomalous nature of the weathering of the Sphinx, and Professor Robert Schock planted a time bomb under the comfortable bottoms of Egyptology <laughs> in 1991 and 92, <laughs> when they forcefully <laughs> and courageously made the case for the precipitation-induced weathering of the Sphinx. And, of course, Egyptologists denounced them and said it couldn't be, that no, po no way, there was no other site in the world that's 12,000 years old. Well, now we have Gobekli Tepe. And every new turn of the archaeologist spade, Indonesia, Gunung Padang, is bringing to the fore new evidence of a lost episode of human history, which the ancient Egyptians themselves recognized, uh, looking back to a time before the historical pharaohs, uh, when the gods walked on earth, Zep Tepe, uh, the first time, the, the, the reign of the divine king Osiris in remote prehistory, uh, and how he is killed by his rival Set and 72 companions. That is, again, one of those precessional numbers. In the tomb of Seti I, we can see this image of the, of the followers of Horus um, who are passing down the tradition from the remote first time to the time of the pharaohs. And here the the souls of Pei and Nekem. This is not Horus and, and uh, Anubis. Uh, these, this is a secret brotherhood that are entrusted with passing down the traditions from the remote to the historical times. In short, I think that Giza is a much more nuanced site than archaeologists would like it to be. I'm pretty happy with the dating of most of the structure of the pyramids to around 2,500 to 3000 BC. I think the pyramids were built on much older foundations. I think the subterranean chamber between the Great Pyramid is prehistoric, beneath the Great Pyramid is prehistoric. And I think, along with Robert Schock and John Anthony West, that the Sphinx Temple, the Vali Temple, uh, are also uh, prehistoric uh, monuments. The Sphinx Temple, the Vali Temple, uh, are also uh, prehistoric uh, monuments. It's interesting, uh, the Vali Temple, uh, limestone core and then co uh, covered in a granite facing stones, most of which have gone. Um, and I wrote to, to Robert back in, in January just to check his view on this. And his view, he, he said to me that the granite sheathing was added in the Old Kingdom to repair and restore the earlier, much earlier Sphinx Age limestone temples. We can't see much of the granite facing here, but actually when you get up close to it, you can see that the granite has been cut on the inside to fit over the weathered limestone blocks. Um, and, and the argument that the granite is much younger than the limestone makes sense. Now, there are some inscriptions on the granite, and those inscriptions are used by Egyptologists to say that this temple was definitely made by Khafre. Um, and, and it's funny, really, how they, how they do it. The Zahi Hawass tells us that the only remaining inscriptions in the building are around the entrance door where they list the king's names and titles. And then Professor I.E.S. Edwards, it's clear where Hawass got his information from. He got it from Edwards. Around each doorway is a band of hieroglyphic inscription giving the name and titles of the king. So it sounds like the name of the king, Khafre, who's supposed to have built that temple, is there. But actually, if you go into it closer, you find that's not correct. Later, Edwards revises his texts, and he admits that the band of hieroglyphics gives the name and titles of the king, but only the last words, beloved, beloved of the goddess Bastet, beloved of the goddess Hathor. The name of the king actually isn't there. Um, and, and uh, you know, some of the suggestions, that, that they find blocks that have been taken away and reused in other places, and they say, oh, those blocks came from the Vali Temple. Um, there's just desperate attempts to attach the Vali Temple to Khafre, uh, which we find reflected in Wikipedia, which is, by the way, uh, a, an organ of the mainstream point of view. Uh, don't believe everything you read in Wikipedia. Um, I wrote to Stephen Quirk at the University of London about this, and he, he put straight that Wiki Wikipedia have got this quite wrong. So between the paws of the Sphinx is this stella, uh, which is the supposed uh, dream stella of Thutmosis IV. Now, it's interesting that, uh, as Salim Hassan tells us, that as to the exact age of the Sphinx and to whom we should tribute its erection, no definite facts are known, and we have not one single contemporary inscription to enlighten us on this point. This is a fact. There isn't a single contemporary inscription of the Sphinx. The very first one is on a limestone stella from the time of Amenhotep 
the second. Uh, and that speaks of the pyramids of Horem Achet, which is one of the names of the Sphinx. It doesn't say the pyramids of Khufu and Khafre. Um, and then we have the Thutmosis IV dream stella, where there used to be the single syllable calf in line 13. That line's actually flaked off. But from that single syllable calf, Egyptologists say, oh, uh, Thutmosis is telling us that Khafre built the Sphinx. But he might not have been referring to Khafre at all. Uh, and he might have been saying that Khafre restored the Sphinx, as Thutmosis did uh, himself. Um, and interestingly, Rainer Steidelman, who was the director of the German Archaeological Institute in Cairo, uh, doesn't agree that the Sphinx was made by Khafre. He thinks it was made by Khufu before Khafre. So Egyptologists can't even agree amongst themselves on the dating of this incredible monument. Um, and there is this stella, which Egyptologists all reject, uh, called the Inventory Stella, uh, which has Khufu, the father of Khafre, coming down to conduct repairs on the Sphinx, which suggests that the Sphinx was already old, uh, even in the time of Khufu. So I think that this diagram is telling us, pay attention to the period of 12,800 to 11,600 years ago, the period of the younger Dryas, uh, and indeed the period 11,600 years ago, 9,000 years before the time of Solon, uh, when Plato tells us that Atlantis was submerged. And Plato prefaces his story with, <coughs> with the account of how Phaeton, the uh, child of the sun, harnessed his father's ca chariot, and effectively he's describing a cosmic impact. Now, most Egyptologists will tell you that there is no Atlantis story in ancient Egyptian annals. And that's one of the reasons they reject Plato. Uh, but one Egyptologist at least dissented, and that was J. Gwyn Griffiths of the University of Wales. Uh, he took a look at an Egyptian story called the, the Tale of the Shipwrecked Sailor. And there are many elements of that story that are like Atlantis. There's a star that falls and that kills the inhabitants of an island. There's flooding, uh, and, and when you, the, the island will not be seen again, it will have become water. Uh, what Gwyn Griffiths didn't look into was the Edfu building texts at the Temple of Horus at Edfu. Now, these texts tell us that they are extracts from material in the archives of the temple. That material, rather like those old source maps that Piri Reis used, was falling apart, was crumbling, was falling to pieces. And uh, they decided to preserve it permanently by inscribing it on the walls of the temple. And these are called the Edfu building texts. Uh, I put this dot surrounded by a circle in the sky here just to remind myself that the Edfu building text described the primeval temple on the homeland of the gods, the, the sacred homeland of the gods, as an island surrounded by rings of water, uh, exactly as Atlantis is described. Um, and we hear of a snake called the Great Leaping One, who's the chief enemy of the god. His assault causes the homeland of the primeval ones to be swallowed up by the sea. Uh, but first, the feet of the deity of the island, the Ka, here explicitly described as the earth god, are pierced and the domain was split. Uh, to cut a long story short, I think that we're uh, looking at uh, the account of the effects of that comet 12,800 years ago. Um, and the Edfu texts speak of the survivors of the destruction of the primeval island of the gods and of their wanderings and how some of them settle in Egypt. Let's go to Peru. Not everything that looks like a landing strip for ET spacecraft is a landing strip for ET spacecraft. At least that was Maria Reiche's view. I had the privilege of knowing her. She was the lady who found and, and uh, exposed the lines to the world. And she pointed out that anybody trying to land on the Nazca Plateau would get stuck, actually, because it's gravel. But uh, let's go inland from there to Cuzco. Um, and uh, Let's look at this curious street corner. Interesting, the Coca-Cola dealer there. Coca-Cola used to co contain cocaine, you know. <laughs> um, and, and look at these different styles of architecture. Let, let's, see, let's see what's going on here. You see, archaeologists attribute all the Peruvian material to the Incas. They say the Incas made this, and they made this, and they made this. But 
it's normally the case where you see very different styles of architecture that you consider the possibility that different cultures were involved. This arguably should have been the best Inca work because this was the place where the virgins who would marry the Inca, the king, were, were kept. Um, it was a sacred, uh, sacred site and, and it's nice work, but it's not nearly as nice as this. Um, here is Sacsayhuaman up above Cusco, these jagged lines of megalithic walls. And all of the school children who visit Sacsayhuaman are told that it was all made by the Incas within a period of 200 years, from 1300 to 1500 AD, very recently. Um, it boggles the mind how these blocks of stone were put together. There isn't a single Inca account of them actually doing this work. Um, that's what happens when you put a block of this sort of size on a modern lorry. Um, and and uh, the only account we have of the Incas trying to draw a big block to the site has them failing utterly and 3,000 people being killed. If you look closely at the site, you find that there are at least three distinct styles of architecture, one involving rock hewing, one involving gigantic megaliths incredibly feisley, nicely fitted together, and a third involving much more clumsy architecture. These are very mysterious, these, these places that are all over uh, the Cusco area. Uh, whole giant boulders just cut into these incredible shapes, and I'm standing here with uh, Jesus Gamara, who is in fact a, an Inca descendant himself, and who one would have thought would, be, would have an investment in uh, saying that the Incas did build everything. But actually, Jesus doesn't think the Incas built everything. He thinks the Incas were very much latecomers. He and his father before him have been studying these sites on the ground between them for more than 100 years. And they have done the most thorough and detailed research. And what they're exposing is these three different styles of architecture and the mistake of attributing them all to one culture just because that happens to fit the historical paradigm. You get stairways like this falling away. At the bottom of that stairway is a hole now covered with um, an iron grating, a locked iron grating, beneath which is a tunnel which is said to lead to the Coracancha in the heart of Cusco. Um, here you can see the very ancient style, the less ancient style, and then the Inca style as, as far as Jesus is concerned. It's absurd to suggest that the same culture that made this also made these rough blocks behind it. You know, there's completely different, completely different work. Uh, if we go to Napo Huaca, uh, you can see this beautiful andesite cut rock here and the, the cutting of the, into the side of the wall, and then this Inca structure in the foreground. To say that the same architects did all of this makes absolutely no sense to me. There are comparisons with the rock-hewn features uh, on the Giza Plateau. I don't have time to go into it here, but there are comparisons also with the Shatia, the foundation stone uh, that once stood beneath the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem and now in the Dome of the Rock. Uh, if we go over to Pizak, overlooking the Sacred Valley, what you can see there is called the Intihuatana, the Hitching Post of the Sun. There is another one of them at Machu Picchu. According to Gamara's studies, that is the oldest feature here. That goes back way beyond 12,000 years ago. Then these finely cut large megalithic blocks around it belong to the second civilization. And then finally, the rougher work is the work of the Incas, that each culture overbuilt the work of the previous culture and that archaeologists are making mistake to attribute them all to the latest comers to the site. Uh, and there you can see the, the Intihuatana overbuilt by the second culture and with Inca work visible in the background. Um, I'll just whiz through the remaining pictures here. This is, uh, this is just by the side of a road above Cusco. But the patterns in it r remind me very much of this huge block at Tiwanaco in Bolivia. Um, just to give you a sense of the size of that block, uh, it's 14,000 feet above sea level, by the way, uh, and hundreds of tons in weight. And we also find these H-shaped blocks at Tiwanaco. Uh, and we find other blocks that look like they're the end pieces of something that something, I believe something metallic was fitted into them. 
and the metal pieces have been lost. They're very finely cut, very curious work here. Um, I'll go into this aspect tomorrow. But what I want to draw attention to is the image of a bearded man that appears on one of the pillars at Tiwanaku. And there's a local legend of Viracocha, uh, a bearded, pale-skinned, civilizing hero who came in a time of darkness after a great flood to bring uh, civilization to the people of the Andes. Now up on the side of this pillar, sideways, is this curious animal here. And we've outlined the animal, and it looks a lot to me like Toxodon, which is an extinct species that went extinct more than 12,000 years ago. On the gateway of the sun at Tiwanaku, there is this curious figure at the side, on the right-hand side, with two tusks and a trunk, looks a lot like an elephant. Uh, and again, the last time we had elephant species in that area is thousands and thousands of years ago. These H-shaped blocks, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but that same pattern, that same H-shape, appears at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. And here in Turkey at Alakahoyuk, we find exactly the same kind of architecture that we find in the Peruvian Andes. Uh, near Cuzco, this jigsaw puzzle patterning of gigantic blocks of stone. This is Kutimbo, uh, uh, near Lake Titicaca, and there are interesting carvings. Again, all of this is given to the Incas by mainstream archaeology. There are interesting carvings on the side of the, those Kutimbo structures, and I just want to compare. That's Kutimbo, that's Nazca, that's Gobekli Tepe. Um, here we have Gobekli Tepe, the animal's tail curling forward. Same thing at Kutimbo, again at Gobek Gobekli Tepe. Uh, these two pieces, one from Gobekli Tepe on the right, the other from Kutimbo on the left, are astonishingly similar in my view. We have serpents and salamanders, both at Gobekli Tepe and Kutimbo. Uh, on the side of a pillar at Gobekli Tepe, we have this large-headed serpent and the same kind of serpent with that large, almost newt-like or sperm-like head is found uh, carved onto the side of this cave at uh, Cusco. The Kutimbo pillar has these two little figures emerging out of it with their hands arranged in a very definite pattern in front of them. And you find the same emergence of a figure with its hands in front of it from that pillar in Gobekli Tepe. Um, there is a serpent on the side of the pillar from Tiwanaku, as there is a serpent on the side of the pillar from Gobekli Tepe. Viracocha, his travels eventually took him to Manta in Ecuador, uh, from where he crossed the Pacific Ocean walking on the water, hints of a high technology, and a lost archaeological report uh, of underwater structures uh, off uh, the coast of Peru and Ecuador, um, going back to the 1960s. Easter Island which Robert Schock will be dealing with tomorrow. We are told that these uh, Easter Island figures are seven or 800 years old, the Moai of Easter Island. Um, and that dating is based largely on organic material uh, pulled out of the walls on which some of the figures stand. Now, can you see the contradiction? Because if you look at this wall, you'll see that in the wall on the right, there is actually an ancient Easter Island head embedded in the wall. Do you see that? Well, that tells us that the wall is younger than the Easter Island figures because they cannibalized a head from one of the figures to build the wall. Um, is it possible that the figures are much older? If you go to Ranuraraku Quarry, uh, you can see the Easter Island heads sticking out of the ground. I'm nearly finished, by the way. Two more minutes, we'll be out of here. Um, you might think that they don't go down very far, but Tor Heyerdahl, who excavated the site in the 50s and again in the 80s, showed that these figures actually go down 30 feet under the ground. Um, I had the privilege of knowing Tor Heyerdahl. He was a great man, a big believer in Atlantis, as a matter of fact. And I think if he had seen Gobekli Tepe, he would immediately have noticed what many of us have noticed, uh, which is the 
hands of the Gobekli Tepe figures and the hands of the Easter Island figures. The way the hands meet in front of the belly over a belt is astonishingly similar in both cases. And indeed, we find these patterns and shapes all around the world. The Easter Island figures are bearded, of course. They don't just have gigantic chins. Those are beards. Uh, and we find bearded figures at La Venta in Mexico also who do not look at all like Native American Indians. And they're always associated with the legend of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Um, and uh, you can see other examples here uh, of these bearded figures from Monte Alban and Oaxaca in the oldest archaeological strata. Now, interestingly, we find bearded figures in Sumer as well. This one's wearing a fish on his head. Um, and he's carrying a cute little man bag. <laughs> you see? You see the man bags? Um, this is Oannes. He's the civilizer. He's the antediluvian civilizer who brings civilization to the land of Sumer in, in the remote past. Now, the weird thing is that the man bag that the Oannes figures carry is the same as the man bag in this Quetzalcoatl figure from La Venta in Mexico, uh, right the way across the world. How are we to explain that connection, especially since similar man bags appear on the top of one of the Gobekli Tepe pillars? Exactly the same pattern and very similar iconography. I think we may be looking at the symbolism uh, of a, a cult or a brotherhood that passed down knowledge from a lost civilization into historical times, and that what we see is not the invention of architecture and agriculture at Gobekli Tepe, but the reinvention or the transfer of technology from an earlier time. That's the fingerprint of the Younger Dryas Comet. Don't write that comet off. Watch out for the new science that's coming out in the next six months, the new papers that, that settle the matter definitively. There was a comet impact 12,800 years ago. It's possible that some fragments of the debris stream of that comet are still in orbit. Uh, Victor Klub and Bill Napier think that there's a 30-kilometer piece out there orbiting in the torrid meteor stream. We should be looking out for this rather than blithely uh, ignoring it. Um, otherwise, wow. I didn't see that coming. None of us did. You know, our civilization, our so-called civilization, we're so busy slaughtering one another, hating one another, filled with fear and hatred and suspicion, when in fact we're all one. We're all brothers and sisters. There's no difference between a, a, a human being from America and a human being from Turkey and a human being from the Amazon. We're all human beings. And we need to, we need to cultivate that spirit of love. And, and we need, never mind asteroids and comets, we're going to destroy ourselves unless, unless we actually show love. But we are the first civilization that could avert a cosmic disaster if we choose to do so. All it would take is the will and the love. Thank you. What a brilliant presentation. the statement, the body of work, the courage, the brilliance, and the ability to defend new ideas is astounding and utterly amazing attribute and talent that Graham Hancock has, and it's a gift to us all. So a round of applause, please. Things over
Through the clouds I see love shine It keeps me warm 